Welcome everyone to today's TCS Plus Talk. I go by G. I'm the moderator for today's talk. Uh, as operator, we have Oded Regev. And also on the team, we have Clement Kenan, Anindya Day, Ilya Rosenstein, and Thomas Vidic. To start, we're going to have Oded take us around the table and introduce the groups. OK, thank you, G. Let me try. So we have first uh, Ben Miller with uh, the group from UW Medicine. Hi, everyone. And we have uh, Budima from EPFL, the group from EPFL. Oh, everyone. Uh, and yeah, we, it's great to see some groups from Europe. Uh, we have um, Ilya Rosenstein from Colombia, not far from here. Hi, everyone. We have K. Gopalakrishnan from East Carolina University. Uh, we have um, Michael, Michael Linitz. Hello, Michael from uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, and we have Samson, uh, Samson from Purdue. And, and we have Sankir from uh, UCSD. And you can see it's very dark. It's supposed to be morning there. Uh, we have the uh, uh, Sayed from the, the group from uh, Shahid Beheshti in uh, Tehran. And um, uh, just oh, so you can actually see you, everyone. Uh, it's the first time I think we have uh, a group from uh, Iran, so welcome. I hope you join again. Uh, we have Shravas with the group here in NYU, a few floors above me. It looks very empty, but I'm sure there's someone there. Um, we have uh, Temis from MIT. Hi, everyone. And finally, we have um, my fellow organizer, Thomas Vidi, for the group from Caltech. OK, so back to you, G. Great. Thank you, Oded. Uh, so I, again, I want to remind you that you should ask questions if you have any. Uh, and I want to let you know about a couple of the upcoming talks. Two weeks from now, we'll have Ola Svensson telling us about some uh, exciting results on uh, ATSP. And then one week after that, to avoid a conflict with uh, th American Thanksgiving, we have Vinod by Kuntanathan. Now let me uh, tell you about today's speaker. Today we're very lucky to have uh, Seth Petty speaking to us. Seth Petty is a professor at the University of Michigan. He did his PhD at University of Texas, Austin. He spent a few years at uh, Max Planck Institute as a postdoc. He's uh, what, best known perhaps for his work on uh, graph algorithms, including work on matchings and an optimal algorithm for uh, MST, which uh, won best paper at ICALP. Uh, he's also known for his work on other algorithmic problems, including, for example, uh, work on threesome. And today he's going to tell us about a, a time hierarchy theorem in the uh, local model. Without further ado, Seth Petty. Oh, uh, first I want to thank the TCS Plus organizers for uh, inviting me to give this talk. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Um, so this is joint work with uh, my student uh, Yirun Chang. Uh, and this paper is sort of the, the, the middle uh, edition of a trilogy of papers that looks at sort of a complexity theory in the local model. Okay. So um, the title says time hierarchy. So what is that? The time hierarchy theorem is one of the classics of uh, complexity theory. It says basically informally, if you give a Turing machine more time, it can solve more problems. So formally it says for any uh, time complexity T of N, not really any, any time complexity, it has to be uh, has satisfy a couple of constraints like time constructability. Uh, but there's gonna be at least one problem that you can solve in this time, but you can't solve in uh, less time asymptotically. And um, I think, uh, it, it, we don't often dwell on you know what this theorem, um, what the takeaway messages are from this theorem. I mean, syntactically, it it says something, um, but it does you know give us a few takeaway messages. The time hierarchy is uh, infinite. There are not a finite number of uh, uh, of possible complexities, um, and the time hierarchy is very dense. Uh, there are problems that take linear time. There's problems that take n to the 1.01 time, et cetera, et cetera, and um, and these, uh, these problems that have this, these characteristics uh, that you can solve in n to the 1.02 time, but not uh, less time, are a little ridiculous. I mean, the, the time hierarchy is populated with problems that were designed to prove the theorem, and they're not the sort of problems that you encounter in everyday life. 
So whenever you see a, a model of computation, uh, a natural question to ask is basically, what is, what is the analog of the time hierarchy in this uh, model of computation? What, what are the complexities that you can achieve? Is it infinite? Is it dense? And so forth and so on. OK, so the problem or the, the model that I'm, uh, I'm looking at is the, is the uh, sort of the simplest uh, uh, model of distributed computation that takes locality uh, into account. It's called the local model. Uh, so we imagine that the, there's some underlying graph of uh, nodes, which we identify with uh, computers, in this case, uh, Macintosh's circa 1984. Um, each vertex is a computer. Each edge uh, allows for bidirected uh, communication between them. Um, we imagine that there's some drumbeat of time uh, marking off synchronized rounds. And in each round, every computer gets to send a message to uh, their neighbors. So to simplify things, uh, we're only going to count rounds. Time is rounds. And uh, in between rounds, the computers can do as much computation as they want, given the information they have. And when it's time to send a message, the, the size of the message is completely unbounded. So there's variants of the local model where uh, uh, message size has to be some reasonable uh, number, let's say log n bits or something. OK. So one thing that comes up, I mean, one of the you know, types of problems that you end up solving in the, in the local model are symmetry breaking problems. And randomization comes in uh, very handy when you're solving symmetry breaking problems. So in the deterministic local model, uh, we're assuming that, the, that the, uh, each um, computer is running a, a, a single deterministic algorithm. And in the randomized model, uh, they can locally generate uh, any number of random bits they want. Okay, but there's no global shared randomness. OK, so what does a vertex know in this model? It doesn't initially know very much. It has to learn everything through these rounds of communication. Uh, initially, we, we assume that every vertex uh, has a, a common knowledge uh, uh, bound on n, the number of vertices, and delta, the maximum degree. Uh, we assume vertices know uh, some sort of unique identifier. A lot of problems are just um, provably impossible to solve deterministically unless you have some uh, identification or broken some kind of uh, symmetry initially. So these IDs are a rather weak assumption. And um, just so that each node can talk about its, um, its edges uh, as you know, distinct entities and, and, and give them names and send messages along one edge but not another, we assume that the nodes have some port numbering of their edges so they can distinguish them. OK, so what is a natural problem? Um, so if you're looking for a time hierarchy theorem, you have to basically rule out some dumb answers to this question. So for example, um, let's say I want to say prove that there is a problem that can be solved in only logarithmic time and no less. Well, that's sort of trivial. Uh, you could just say the problem is for every vertex to decide whether the number of vertices that are within distance log n is odd or even. Um, and obviously, you need to actually look at your entire neighborhood to figure out the answer of that question. So we want to uh, find a definition of a natural problem that basically uh, includes everything that we're interested in and excludes ridiculous problems. So now and Stockmeyer uh, came up with a definition that I uh, especially like. And um, it's basically all problems that can be expressed in the following way. Uh, the output is going to be some labeling of the graph, like uh, with vertex labels, let's say, colors or something. And you should be able to check that a labeling is uh, correct in constant time. OK, so this is sort of the, the, uh, the analog of, of non-deterministic uh, constant time Turing machines or something. Um, so more formally, what are, what are we talking about here? Uh, there's going to be some sort of input alphabet. So each node is going to be initially labeled with some uh, 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 label from uh, sigma in. and uh, it will eventually be labeled with uh, an element of sigma out at the end of the computation. And there's some integer uh, radius r, so that a vertex can tell whether it's labeled correctly uh, just by looking at its r neighborhood. So an important thing to uh, note here is that the, the, the sigmas here, these, uh, these alphabet sizes, um, have to do with the local uh, graph parameters. So you, um, uh, they can depend on delta, for example, uh, but they uh, are assumed to be independent uh, of n. OK, 
So an LCL problem is basically defined by a set of labelings that is uh, acceptable. Okay, so we're just going to enumerate all of them essentially. So conceptually, uh, C is just a list of acceptable radius R labeled centered subgraphs, centered at a particular vertex. So uh, I'll give an example in a second. So the problem is we're given an input labeling, compute an output labeling so that everybody's R neighborhood looks good and looks good means uh, is isomorphic to an element of C. So for example, uh, this is a vertex and this is what it would see if it looked out to radius one. And um, this is without any labels. Uh, if the problem that we're solving is three coloring, then these would be two acceptable uh, one neighborhoods. And uh, this one would be an unacceptable one neighborhood for the, the three coloring problem. And in this problem, uh, uh, sigma out has uh, is a set of size three and sigma in is a set of size one because there are no input labels. Everything is, is initially uh, white, I guess. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Uh, so one question set. Yeah. Uh, so in what sense is the problem you mentioned before not natural? Um, well, I mean, if you look at the time hierarchy theorem, it makes perfect sense, right? I mean, every problem that is used in the time hierarchy theorem specifically refers to uh, a specific running time inside the definition of the problem. So in that sense, I mean, there's precedent, uh, but it's unnatural in the sense that these, these problems uh, don't seem to show up in nature. I mean, we don't really care about, uh, you know, a vertex's log n neighborhood in a graph of indeterminate size because, you know, n, we might just be guessing on the size of n anyway. I guess my question was not so much on the philosophical level, but uh, why does it not fit under the definition of LCL? Ah, because uh, R has to be a constant independent of everything else. And uh, sigma n and sigma, uh, oh yeah, so that's it. R, R has to be a constant. That's why I would rule out that problem. So for, I mean, typical problems, R is going to be one, maybe maybe two, you know, for all, let's say the, the proper coloring problem, R needs to be one for, uh, you know, edge coloring, depending on how you do the labelings, two is a sufficient radius to check that an, an edge coloring is locally consistent and so forth. Okay. Okay, so um, I think uh, last uh, semester, uh, Mosin gave a uh, talk on the local model. It was very nice. And he surveyed a lot of things that, um, that uh, people study in the local model, which are uh, uh, greedy problems. So greedy problems, I'm gonna just define a greedy problem to be one where basically you can extend any partial solution to a total solution. Um, and maximal independent set, maximal matching, delta plus one vertex coloring, two delta minus one edge coloring, these are all the, the, the classics, okay? And for reasons that will become clear in a second, uh, we're not gonna um, find these greedy problems very uh, interesting, uh, and I'll show why in a couple of slides. So we're mostly gonna be, gonna be thinking about uh, locally checkable problems that do not have greedy solutions. So these are, let's say, finding uh, a decent approximation to a maximum matching, orienting the edges of an undirected graph so that there's no sinks, uh, assuming that uh, the graph can be delta uh, vertex colored, then finding one. Uh, two delta minus two edge coloring. This is just slightly less than uh, is allowed by the, the greedy algorithm and various other notions of, uh, of coloring. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna start plotting all these time hierarchy uh, type results on basically uh, an asymptotic complexity line where on the left end of the line you have basically trivial problems that you can solve in constant time or maybe even zero time, and uh, problems that uh, require the diameter of the network time. So this is the, in, in the local model, this is as, as bad as it can possibly get. You know, in Turing machines, there's an infinite uh, number of complexities. There is no maximum complexity. Uh, but here, uh, we really know that there is a maximum. You, you can solve any problem you want in the diameter of the network time. Okay, so every problem can be solved at this point. And all greedy problems uh, on, on, on uh, constant degree graphs, and for the rest of this talk, I'm gonna more or less focus on just constant degree graphs. All greedy problems basically end up at the exact same uh, complexity class. And the, and the reason is that um, when delta is constant, 
what you can do is uh, apply Lineal's uh, classic algorithm and delta squared color uh, the graph, and then uh, march through the color classes uh, one at a time. And when um, uh, a vertex is deciding its output label, uh, it uh, it uh, looks in its neighborhood and then and then chooses one according to the greedy algorithm. So basically, any greedy greedily solvable problem uh, on constant degree graphs is going to have one complexity. Okay, so there's a lot of gaps here, obviously. There's a big gap between log star and diameter, and there's gaps between constant log star, and we'd like to know what, what's in those gaps. Okay, so um, before and concurrent with this work, uh, people basically uh, settled the landscape of what complexities you can get on pretty simple network topologies. So. Uh, this, what I'm about to show, applies equally well to uh, uh, paths, cycles, uh, grids, and toruses. So uh, the main distinction between like a, a grid and a torus is grids have corners, uh, and in toruses, uh, you know, every vertex sees precisely the same neighborhood. Uh, equation? Yeah. Uh, so basically, this log star and bound, is it randomized or deterministic? It's deterministic. I see. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the algorithm to, to delta squared color uh, a graph is deterministic. Okay, so what we have here is uh, a nice situation, which is basically everything you see in the picture is about all that you can possibly get in these particular network topologies. So uh, now we're in Stockmeyer, uh, back in the 90s, showed that uh, if, your gra if, your, um, if your algorithm solves an LCL problem in constant time, then it can be put in a certain canonical form where it basically ignores the values of the vertex IDs, these log n bit identifiers, and it just functions based on the total order of the vertex IDs that it sees. So in this sense, it doesn't really care what the space of the IDs is, just the fact that they come from a totally ordered set is all that it, uh, it needs to run in constant time. And um, they didn't really phrase this result as a, as a speed up theorem, uh, but it can be phrased that way, and, and the details are in um, uh, these two papers here. So uh, on uh, paths and cycles, uh, basically any problem that you can solve in asymptotically less than log star and time can be automatically sped up to be constant. And the reason is basically once you make an algorithm order invariant, uh, you, it, it has no experience of what n is. It can't see the graph, so it doesn't know what n is in terms of number of nodes, it uh, it no longer cares about how many bits are in the in the ID, so you can lie about what n is. Okay, and interestingly, uh, on paths and cycles, there are no complexities in the other part of the spectrum either. So anything that runs in more than log star n time, but asymptotically less than the the diameter time, so like less than square root of n for a grid or a, a torus, can be automatically sped up to run in log star time. And again. Uh, the main technique here is lying. Um, if, you, if you imagine that you're a node in the middle of, of a very large grid or torus, uh, and you look out to some radius that's less than the diameter, uh, you're going to see some subgraph. You already knew the topology of the subgraph that you'd see. And, um, and if someone told you that uh, that's, you know, n is different than what it is, uh, you'd have no way to, uh, to contradict them. So it's very easy to lie to uh, uh, an algorithm and create the circumstances where it thinks it's living in a much, much smaller graph than it actually is, and, uh, and therefore you can, you can speed it up by, by tricking it. So, um, <clears throat> okay. So that says, uh, and the, the paths and cycles are basically the same. So here's one way where they're completely different. Uh, everything basically is decidable on a path. Uh, all, the, all these three complexities are uh, decidable on a path, whereas on a grid or a torus, um, you can't distinguish between constant time and diameter time. Uh, basically, so if you're given a description of the LCL, you know, in terms of explicitly uh, acceptable uh, R neighborhoods, then um, uh, you can encode in this LCL uh, uh, the functioning of a Turing machine that, that uh, you know, uh, is given an empty tape and you just want to, you know, tell if it halts or not. Okay, so if it doesn't halt, then there's no way to solve this LCL in less than diameter time, and if it does halt, you can solve it in constant time. Um, so, uh, this proof on a grid is basically trivial, and on a torus, because there's no corners, you have to do a lot of work, and that's in the, the Brandt et al. paper. 
OK, so why is lying so easy? Uh, this is one of the reasons that uh, the local model doesn't has a sort of funny uh, time hierarchy, which is um, there's this there's this parameter n that the algorithms uh, you know use to determine the running time. The running times are a function of n uh, when delta is constant, and n uh, refers to actually three distinct strings. So n is uh, the size of the graph. Uh, log n is the number of bits in a vertex ID, and when you're running a randomized algorithm and you tell it you know it's okay to fail, but just fail with this a, a certain probability. Um, you can think of the probability as being a separate parameter, but we always fix it to be one over poly n. Okay, so you can think of n as being, you know, just influencing the the error probability. And uh, all of these statistics here are a little bit unreliable, right? Unless you see the entire graph, you don't exactly know what n is. And if someone changed the vertex IDs in your neighborhood, uh, then you know, to be, let's say, come from a smaller set, then you're none the wiser. So the number of bits in your vertex ID can be uh, can be manipulated. And um, and uh, you can always just run an algorithm with a different error probability. So the even number three is sort of a, a fungible uh, number. So I think th this is basically the slide that says, explains why lying works in this model and it probably doesn't work in most computational models. You can't lie about the size of the input. OK, so uh, this paper addresses uh, more uh, expressive gra uh, graph topology. So we have general graphs, bounded degree graphs, and uh, bounded degree trees. So everything I'm going to talk about applies equally well to both, except for one thing, which only applies to uh, trees. So um, the Nauer-Stockmeyer argument uh, is, uh, is uh, based on these uh, uh, hypergraph uh, uh, Ramsey numbers. And uh, it basically says you can speed up any algorithm if it runs sufficiently fast. So in, in, in general graphs and trees, sufficiently fast is less than log log star uh, time. So we get a, a gap there in the lower end of the spectrum. Um, so a, a line of work that uh, showed up in 2016 uh, actually separated randomized and deterministic complexity in a narrow range between uh, basically constant time and log n time. OK, so we actually have two branches here in the on the, the complexity spectrum here, depending on whether you're talking about deterministic bounds or, or randomized bounds. So um, at the Fox 2016, uh, we proved this automatic speed up theorem that says if you have a if you have an algorithm that runs in less than log n time, sublogarithmic time, then you can automatically speed it up to run in log star time. So this is sort of a um, uh, showing that there's there's there are no natural complexities between these uh, two extremes for LCL problems. And moreover, you get a similar um, uh, uh, gap in the randomized spectrum, but it's not the same. So in general, uh, we showed that the randomized complexity of any problem is at least its deterministic complexity on instances that are logarithmic in that size. So uh, one um, uh, implication of this is that there's no natural complexities between log star n and log log n in, in the randomized universe. OK, so here we have the possibility of an exponential separation. Uh, leaves open the possibility that you could have a problem that requires log n time deterministically, but log log n time uh, randomized. And we now actually have, um, I think, three, and maybe only three, um, three or four, depending on how you count, examples of problems where we know that this exponential separation actually shows up. So the first problem uh, to be shown with a, an exponential separation is a problem of um, if you're given a, a, tr uh, a tree with maximum degree delta to find any delta vertex coloring of the tree. OK, so trees are too colorable, but even finding a delta coloring of a tree turns out to be kind of tricky. And uh, it takes log log n time randomized and log n time deterministically. The same is true of synclist orientation on uh, a graph with a, a sufficiently large minimum degree. And uh, 2 delta minus 2 edge coloring. So this was shown, these results are followed from a series of papers that came out in the last uh, two, two years and the future. OK. So our first um, result, and the one that I'm going to show pretty much the entirety of the proof uh, in this talk, is that uh, there's a gap in the randomized hierarchy 
uh, between log n and the complexity of the, lo the Lovash uh, local lemma, the distributed complexity of the Lovash local lemma. So we can think of this as a, as a completeness result. It says if you have an algorithm and it runs in sublogarithmic time, then uh, its running time is actually at most the Lovash local lemma. So the LLL is, is sort of complete for this uh, complexity class. Okay. And the next result uh, that I'm going to talk about is that this, uh, up until now, it was consistent with everything we knew that there were just a finite number of complexities and all LCL problems fit in that finite set. And it turns out that there's a, a, a class of somewhat contrived uh, coloring problems uh, that we invented exactly for the, the purpose of proving this theorem. They don't really um, you know, show up in other uh, places. And um, it's sort of a, a K-level version of the two coloring problem with a little bit of you know, extra flexibility. So it's sort of two and a half coloring. Um, but anyway, so what we do is we show that, uh, that this particular problem, which is sort of uh, parameterized by a constant K, uh, has complexity exactly n to the one over K, and that this is uh, optimal for you know, randomized or deterministic uh, algorithms. It doesn't really matter. Uh, randomness provably doesn't help with this, uh, with this class of problems. Okay, and then on trees, uh, we get one extra result. So if, if your graph class is the class of bounded degree trees, then uh, we have a, an exponent, a, a gap theorem that says that there are no natural complexities between log n and n to the little o of one. And uh, philosophically, this is sort of um, interesting because if you read the literature on local algorithms, people come up with local algorithms all the time that actually do have complexities that lie in this range. They're poly log n, or they're two to the square root of log n, or something like that. It's very common to see complexities that are actually in this range. So on trees, we can, we can show through this mechanical process, you're given an LCL, and an algorithm that solves this LCL in, in let's say, end of the little o of one time, that it can be automatically uh, sped up and de-randomized and, and run in log n time. And um, this gap theorem, uh, I'm, won't have time to, uh, to talk about it, but it's qualitatively completely different than the other gap theorems in that it doesn't involve lying about n. It doesn't involve tricking an algorithm into thinking the graph is much, much smaller. Uh, it's based on uh, completely different principles. Okay, so um, yeah, so I'm gonna look at the first result now. This, uh, this idea that the Lavash local lemma is complete for sublogarithmic time. So uh, you may be f familiar with the LLL, but I'm gonna describe the uh, differences that you see in the distributed version of the constructive Lavash lemma, lo uh, local lemma. So you can define an asymmetric version of this uh, problem, just like uh, the asymmetric LLL, uh, but for simplicity, we'll, we're gonna look at the symmetric version. Okay, so the main difference is as follows. Um, the LLL creates a dependency graph, which I'll get to. And uh, the, the basic assumption is that the communications network and the dependency graph are identical. Okay, so how do you get this dependency graph? Um, the set of vertices are, uh, you can think of them as bad events that you do not want to happen. And each uh, vertex uh, depends on a set of uh, variables. So each variable is, let's say, discrete, and we know its distribution. And uh, we're not going to get into specifying that, but each, ver uh, each uh, uh, vertex v, or u in this case, depends on a set of discrete random variables, which we'll call uh, the variable set u. So um, if the variable sets of two vertices are disjoint, then whether these bad events happen are obviously independent. Um, and we're defined the dependency graph to be uh, you connect uh, a vertices u and v if their variable sets uh, intersect. So the symmetric version of this lemma uh, says uh, there's only two parameters of interest here when we're, when we're judging whether, uh, whether uh, uh, we can find a good variable assignment. Uh, it's going to be the maximum degree in the dependency graph and the maximum probability that any event uh, occurs when the variables are selected according to their distribution. So a typical uh, LLL criterion says that there always exists such a good assignment if 
uh, let's say e times p times d plus 1 is less than 1. This is a, a standard form of the lemma. And uh, we're going to be looking at LLL criteria that are much, much, much weaker than this. And uh, most of them that we'll look at are polynomial criteria. So basically, the probability that an event occurs is inversely proportional to some polynomial in, in the degree. OK, so the problem is compute a variable assignment such that no uh, bad event occurs. And for the time being, uh, and in the subsequent slides, I'm going to fix this constant c to be whatever the c is in the LLL criterion uh, that's, that we're using. OK, so we're going to have a black box algorithm that solves this uh, LLL problem. And it uh, says it works if, it, uh, if this inequality is satisfied for some uh, specific constant c. So it doesn't really matter what C is, could be, you know, 50 or something. So I'm, still, I'm still a bit confused about definition. Can you say again what exactly the input is and the output? Oh, the input. Okay, so um, you are a vertex. You know the variables that are in your set. You know their distributions. And you know who your neighbors are. You don't have any knowledge of the set of all variables. Uh, but you do know your own variables and their distributions. And those variables, how do they get assignments? Well, they come from some domain. They could be uh, bits, they could be uh, colors, they could, I mean, any any discrete finite distribution is fine. You say I know the variables, I mean, you mean I know the assignment to my variables? You know, there is no assignment. You know their distribution. So you know if each variable is selected according to its distribution, the probability that you are, your bad event occurs is at most p. And are we supposed to choose from that distribution? What was that? Uh, am, I, am I required to choose from the correct distribution somehow? No, no. The, the, the algorithm does not have to choose anything randomly. The algorithm can be deterministic. But the guarantee is if these uh, variables are selected according to a certain distribution, that the probability that they occur is p. You don't actually have to select them randomly. Okay, but it has to uh, be valid. It has to yeah. what? It has to be a satisfying assignment at the end. Yeah, it has to be a satisfying assignment and obviously consistent. You know, two two events that share the same variable have to agree on what the assignment is to that variable. And what where does where is specified? What it means uh, for um, something to be satisfied? Is it part of the input? Um, each vertex cares about the variables that are in its variable set, and it cares about those assignments, and it does not care about anything else. So as long as it picks an assignment that is consistent with its neighbors and makes its own event not bad, not, not, not occur, then it's happy. Okay, so when you say V column bad event, it's not, you, it's not that you mean to say that it's not that V is the set of bad events, right? I think I'm too confused by the second bullet there. Uh, well, they're, I mean, they're identified with bad events, but they're, they're also computers because the dependency graph and the communications network are identical. So the events themselves are communicating in a way. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So the speed up uh, goes like this. We're, we're going to get as input an algorithm A, and the claim is that it solves some LCL problem, some specific LCL problem, in sublogarithmic time with a certain failure probability, which we'll just fix at 1 over n, some polynomially small error probability. OK, so uh, the first thing I'm going to do is say that this, the, the way that this is expressed is, is a little wrong, because when you say sublogarithmic time, what you mean is you know, if n goes to infinity, uh, as n goes to infinity, the running time tends to uh, you know, something little of uh, log n. Okay. But we're not going to make n get large. We're going to make n get very, very, very small. So these, these asymptotic expressions of the running time are not uh, precise enough. So we're going to think of n as becoming very, very small. So uh, we're going to say that the, what, what, what this means, sublogarithmic time, is that uh, for any constant epsilon that we choose, uh, we can express the running time in such a way so that it's upper bounded by something that depends only on delta and something that can be made arbitrarily uh, uh, small uh, uh, compared to log base delta of m. OK. So this c might depend on, on epsilon, for example. But once we fix a specific c, like 1 over 100, we can express it in exactly this form. OK. And most of the algorithms that we, we see that actually do run in sublogarithmic time can easily be expressed in this, in this form. 
Okay. So the next thing that we do is we figure out uh, a small value of n, let's call it n star, such that if you told the algorithm that n is n star, the size of, size of the graph is n star, then it would run in t star time, and t star is uh, sufficiently small relative to log base delta of n star. So uh, there always is such, a t, uh, such an n star. And uh, it's fairly easy to show that the, the T star here is going to be something on the order of, of whatever this term is that depends on delta. OK, so now we're going to lie to the, the algorithm. We're going to say the graph is size n star. Uh, that means that you get to run for T star time. Um, and what is the algorithm going to do? The algorithm is, let's say, the algorithm that, uh, that is running at the vertex v, it's going to uh, gather up let's say all the information in its T star neighborhood, and then decide on its output label, okay? So if V decides on its output label, but it also wants to, let's say, check whether its, it's, uh, it's uh, neighborhood is consistent, you know, whether it, it, it satisfies the, uh, the, the rules of the LCL, then it also needs to generate the labels of its immediate uh, neighbors. So, uh, to get its own label, it needs to gather up its T star neighborhood, but to gather up its, uh, to, to, to generate its own label and its neighbor's labels so it can check consistency, it needs to look up to some T star plus little o of one radius to uh, generate all that information. Okay. So the important thing about this sublogarithmic running time is that uh, V is none the wiser. So in other words, we told V that the size of the graph is N star, and based on what it sees, it sees a subgraph that is consistent with it living in an n star vertex graph. It does not see anything to contradict that fact. And if we change the, the running time to be you know, logarithmic or more, then we would not be able to guarantee this type of uh, indistinguishability. OK, so when are two uh, vertices dependent. They're dependent if basically they depend on any common information uh, whatsoever, which just means that their, their T star plus O of one balls intersect. Okay. Okay, so we're now uh, about ready to actually build the uh, LLL instance and the dependency graph. And we do it as follows. Um, yeah. Sorry, I keep interrupting you, but just so first, it would help if you could say once more what is what it is exactly that you're proving, and also, did you ever mention what complexity LL is? What what do we know? No, about? I will. It's 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 complicated. So it's secret. Okay, there's some number. Okay. Yeah, I will. So yeah, right. Sorry, I should restate. Yeah, what are we doing? We're trying to take an algorithm A. It's a black box algorithm. We don't know how it works. We're guaranteed that it runs in sublogarithmic time, and by sublogarithmic, I mean this running time here. Um, and the idea is we're going to automatically speed it up so that the resulting algorithm runs in something on the order of the complexity of the Lovash local lemma. Which might be log n. So what? what? Yeah. Okay, as far as we know, it might be log n, in which case this is... It might be log n, yeah, but hopefully it'll be a lot faster. Okay, okay. Thanks. Okay. So uh, we now need to build this... Uh, instance to hand to the Lavash local lemma algorithm and it needs to know what the what the events are what the variables are what the uh dependency graph looks like and everything so the variables are basically everything that uh was generated all the random bits that were generated locally at v form we'll call it one random variable xv and this encapsulates everything that, that uh, was controlled by v in the algorithm okay so uh, a vertex uh, V is influenced by U, the, the, let's say the random bits generated by U, if they are uh, sufficiently close, if they're too far away, just they can't influence each other. So there's, you know, has no bearing on it. So if U and V uh, are at distance T star plus uh, uh, O of one, um, it should be two T star, not, that's a typo, should be two T star plus of one, then, um, oh, sorry, 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 yeah, th this is correct. So yeah, the variables of V are everything that influence the behavior of V, and that's everything in its T star plus O of one neighborhood. And the dependency graph is, uh, we have an event for each, uh, for each vertex. So the event EV is the event that 
uh, these neighborhood is inconsistently labeled according to the rules of the LCL. So by the definition of the algorithm A, the probability that this uh, event happens is almost one over N, but we're lying to the algorithm, so it's not one over N, it's one over uh, N star in this case. So the probability that EV happens is, is one over N star. And the dependency graph H is we have a vertex for each uh, of these bad events, and we connect up two bad events if they uh, share variables, which in this case means that their distance is roughly two T star. Okay, so the LLL parameters here are uh, the probability of error is one over N star, and because uh, the, under, the, the degree in the underlying graph, let's say, is delta, uh, the degree in the dependency graph D is delta to the roughly two T star. Okay, so this satisfies the LLL criterion uh, basically by design. We, we chose T star specifically so that the exponent here would be less than log base delta of N star. Okay, so at this point, we have our dependency graph, we have the random variables and their distributions, we have the uh, bad events, each bad event knows which variables it depends on, so we have an instance that we can hand to a distributed LLL algorithm and say, uh, find me a variable assignment that satisfies everything. And of course, what that means is find me uh, 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 the outcomes of these coin flips at every vertex so that nobody uh, makes a mistake. No one, no one has a, a neighborhood that is inconsistent with the LCL. So um, the real underlying communications network is G, and we're running this algorithm on H, and because vertices in H are connected by a path of uh, length C of delta in G, we can just simulate this algorithm with a certain uh, slowdown that, that depends on that factor. Okay, so if delta is constant, this is a constant slowdown, and we get uh, something that's uh, linear in the complexity of the Lavash local lemma. Okay, um, so that's the end of the proof. And if there's any questions, I, I should ask them now. And, and in the next slide, I'm going to go over basically what is the complexity of the Lavash lo local lemma and what do we know about it. So, okay, I'll go on. Okay, I'll try my luck uh, once more. So. Um, yeah. Where is that they actually use the fact that it's sub-logarithmic? Uh, could, when it affects plugging? Oh, sub-logarithmic. Okay, so here's, a, here's an example. Um, so we're, we're using the fact that it's sub-logarithmic uh, when we're saying uh, the algorithm has to perform as advertised because what this vertex V sees is consistent with a subgraph inside an N star vertex graph. Now, as soon as an algorithm runs in logarithmic time, you can't claim this type of thing. For example, I can say, um, uh, you know, the algorithm needs to see a degree two vertex or a degree one vertex or a cycle. And it can always see one of those three things if it runs in log n time, because if you look out to log n radius, you're going to see a degree one vertex, a degree two vertex or a cycle, okay? But anything that runs in sublogarithmic time, it can never, it can never uh, depend on seeing one of those types of, uh, of graph features. Okay, so we're allowed to lie to it in this sense because it can't distinguish lying from truth. But where does it show up in the proof? Um, we just can't even proceed. There, there, I mean, there's no way to get past this step. If, if V can tell the difference between you lying to it and you not lying to it, then you can't proceed. So the claim is that V sees a subgraph that has fewer than N star vertices in it. And there's no way it can, uh, it, and it sees a subgraph that's consistent with a ver living inside an N star vertex graph. And that's because T star is basically much, much less than log base delta of N star. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah, and then. Uh, so in the next slide, how did you get C of delta? How did you manage to get capital C of delta without the extra log when you said that the um, slowdown is only by a factor of uh, C of delta? Yeah, this is, uh, I mean, C of delta could be the dominant term until N gets to be uh, some size, and then, uh, and then eventually this epsilon log delta N will be the dominant term. 
right? So we're just waiting for this second thing to be the dominant term. And when it is, uh, when it dominates the C delta, uh, we'll stop when it's uh, when the leading constant here is one over two C. Mm -hmm. So so epsilon, I mean, the epsilon that we pick is going to depend on C. It's going to be something, you know, something on the order of one over C. How can I think of this n star and the t star? Those are all constants? Yes, these are constants that depend on uh, everything that you see in the running time here. The epsilon, the capital C. Yeah, these are all constants that, that depend on those things. Got you. And the, the running time actually comes from the LLL. Once you have the LLL, everything is... Um, That's right. right. Yeah. So yeah, star. n star and t star are constants. I should have emphasized that. Yeah. So what's so special about failure probability one over n? How robust is it? Um, that's how we measure error probabilities. Probabilities typically in uh, in algorithms. So, um, I mean, I I could choose one over square root of n. One, I mean, so it's robust. N squared, they're all the yeah. same. There's nothing special about one over n. You could, you could do not it too special now. Yeah. Any inverse polynomial is fine. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, Okay, so what do we know about the LLL? Uh, the LLL has, a, of course, a very deep history. I'm just going to start in 2010 with Mosher and Tardos uh, because, well, it's a nice algorithm, and it's the first algorithm that was, um, I think, specifically uh, mentioned that it can solve it in a, in a distributed network. So uh, their algorithm uh, runs in log squared n uh, time and satisfies the, a pretty strict LLL criterion. Uh, we showed... Uh, Several years later, that uh, when there are weaker criterion, you can run it in log n time. And it's still using the Mo Mojo Tardos framework, well, resampling basically. It's a natural randomized algorithm. Uh, the lower bounds are nice. Uh, so Brandt et al. showed a new uh, lower bound technique uh, and uh, proved that a, a specific problem whose existence uh, is proved using the LLL needs log log n time. And therefore, the LLL itself also needs log log n time. And this is uh, this holds with just about any reasonable criterion, even something that's exponential like this. Was, uh, this lower bound holds even in this case. Um, so this is for randomized algorithms. Uh, we showed that it can be de-randomized and, and, and made exponentially larger. So deterministic LLL algorithms require uh, log n time. And uh, in the paper, which we originally posted on the archive, we, we conjectured that log log n should be the right answer for some polynomial criterion. Where you get to pick the C, you can make it as big as you want, as long as it's constant, log log n should be, should be the right answer for some C. And um, uh, uh, Emanuela Fisher and Mosin Ghaffari got to work immediately and uh, started trying to prove this conjecture. And they came up with some pretty spiffy algorithms. So their first algorithm is randomized, and it runs in slightly sublogarithmic time, uh, where the sublogarithmic part here is sort of uh, measured according to the you know strength or weakness of the LLL criterion. So it's you know the exponent here is inversely proportional to c. So if c is you know 10, let's say you get something uh, sublogarithmic here. And you, uh, you pay for the, the degree in the dependency graph. So one thing that we didn't immediately anticipate when we proved our, uh, this, this gap theorem is that, uh, the, um, is that it could be used on the LLL algorithm itself. I mean, the input algorithm might be solving the LLL, and the output algorithm might be a sped up version of that uh, algorithm. So this is exactly what Fisher and Ghaffari did. They used this algorithm as, a, as the sublogarithmic algorithm, fed it into the reduction, and it turns out that when d is sufficiently small, you can get a very strongly sublogarithmic uh, uh, running time with a polynomial LLL criterion. Okay, so that's the state of the art for general graphs. And uh, in a SOTA paper coming up soon, we, we proved uh, this conjecture in the special case of tree structured. Uh, dependency graph. So if, you, if your underlying graph is a tree, then the dependency graph that pops out of that is tree structured in a sense. And on that class of dependency graphs, we can we can actually achieve log log n time. So uh, Seth, I have a question. Uh, in the picture that you showed way back, uh, this if you your conjecture was true, this would basically imply that there is no intermediary things. It's basically uh, log n, log log n, and log star n. Is that true? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, so for trees, there is no intermediate stuff. Log log n is where the LLL is, and there's nothing in between that and log n. 
Okay, so uh, that's all I'm going to say about the LLL. So let's get to the real, um, the title of the paper at least. It's the the time hierarchy. How do you get these infinite number of complexities? So uh, the problem uh, is two and a half coloring, and it's going to look a lot like two coloring, but with a lot of extra rules. So the first thing that we're going to do, uh, the, even to explain what the rules are, depends on this uh, graph partition. Okay. So k is an input is a is a parameter of the problem, and it's uh it's fixed. It's some constant like two or three. Uh, and the example I'm going to give k will be three. So we partition the graph uh, into uh, vertices as follows. Uh, v1 is all vertices with degree one or two. Uh, and when you peel those out of the graph, uh, any vertex that now has degree one or two is part of v2. And when you peel those out of the graph, any vertex that has degree one or two is now part of V3, and so forth and so on. So here's an example of a graph. Um, we would assign all of these things here uh, to be level one vertices, V1, the green ones. And then when you remove those green vertices, then you get a bunch of new degree one and degree two vertices, and all of these would be called level two. And then when you remove those, you get a bunch more degree two vertices or degree one vertices, and all of those are called level three. So obviously by design, when you look at the connected components of vertices that are induced at a particular level, um, they're always going to be um, paths or cycles. Okay. okay, so the problem is to color this graph according to the following rules. So the two colors are black and white. Those are the first two symbols. Um, but you don't have to color every vertex black or white. You're allowed two other options. Uh, some vertices are exempt. They don't need to be colored. And that's a good thing. And some vertices can choose not to color themselves, and they can abstain. So we have exempt, abstain, or color yourself black or white. And the exemption rule uh, says that uh, if you are a vertex, let's say at level i, and you have a neighbor at a lower level, and that neighbor did color themselves black or white, then you don't need to be colored. You can color yourself exempt. OK. So everybody who's colored exempt uh, is, let's say, part of the set x. OK, the tool coloring rule uh, says that if you look at the path or cycle induced by vertices at a particular level, and you Ignore the exempt vertices, you take those out. So you have, um, uh, this, only, this rule only applies to vertices that were not colored by the exemption rule. Then whatever remains is, you have two different options about what to do. Uh, you're allowed to two color the path with black and white, or you're allowed to make everybody on the path simultaneously abstain. You can't have any middle ground here. Either everyone does participates in the valid two coloring, or everyone simultaneously abstains. Okay. So up until now, a pretty obvious uh, way to satisfy these rules is just everybody abstain. So we need a rule that says that's not going to happen. And the level k rule says that uh, any degree one vertex in the graph at the highest level um, cannot abstain and therefore must be two-colored or uh, be exempt. OK, so this is the set of rules. and. Um, I'll describe an algorithm, and then once you see the, the shape of the algorithm, it'll be pretty clear um, uh, you know, why it's plausibly optimal. OK, so the theorem is, is that uh, this version of the problem, uh, the k-level hierarchical 2 and a half coloring, takes n to the 1 over k time. So I'm going to show you the algorithm, and it's deterministic. And the, uh, and the lower bound says that even randomized algorithms can't uh, do better than this with more than uh, negligible probability of success. Okay, so the algorithm, the idea is you uh, you color the vertices in exactly the order that these uh, sets were uh, were peeled off. So you color all of v1, then you color all of v2, v3, up to vk. Okay, so we're coloring a vertex u at the ith level, let's say, and uh, the first thing we do is just see if it's if it's under the exemption rule. So it looks at its neighbors. If it sees any lower level neighbor that got colored black or white already, then it just says, I'm exempt, and it joins the set X. And then if it doesn't satisfy that rule, uh, this vertex U uh, identifies the path or cycle in its level that contains it, okay? 
Um, and it does one of two things. So it uh, determines that either uh, p is a cycle or p is a path and p is too long. Too long in this case is on the order of n to the 1 over k. OK, so if you're a cycle or the path is too long, then everybody simultaneously on p uh, abstains. And they can figure out which case they're in in roughly n to the 1 over k time. So if p is less than um, n to the 1 over k, 2 times n to the 1 over k, and a path, then it two colors itself. And that also takes n to the 1 over k time. OK, so um, that's the entire algorithm. Um, so it obviously runs in the right time. The only thing that you have to check is that uh, it doesn't cause any vertex on the top level to abstain. And the reason roughly goes like this. Uh, the only way you could possibly abstain on the top level is if you had, a, let's say, uh, a path of length greater than 2 to the 2 times n to the 1 over k. And the only way you could possibly have a path of that length on the top level is if there were n to the 2 over k vertices on the top two levels. And the only way that could happen is if there were n to the 3 over k vertices on the top three levels, and so forth and so on. And the only way that all of these things can simultaneously be true is if you had more than n vertices in the graph on all the levels combined, and that can't happen. So therefore, the top level can never have a path of length longer than n to the 1 over k. Okay, and the lower bound uh, basically, yeah. Sorry, uh, yeah, I have a quick question. So you, um, yeah. is it, you haven't said this, maybe it's obvious, so the nodes can figure out what, which set V1, V2, et cetera, they're, they're in? Yeah, they can figure out which set they're in, in, in on the order of k time. K time. Yeah, right. right. Every okay. vertex just looks at its neighbors, counts them, says I'm either degree one or two. If you are, you alert all your neighbors and say I'm in the set V1, so they know the node to subtract you from their degree count. If their degree becomes one or two, then they alert their neighbors that they're in set V2, and so forth and so on. Yeah, thanks. OK. Yeah, so uh, yeah, so we have this sort of um, uh, behavior where you, you simply cannot have a very long path at the top level. Uh, otherwise, uh, you would have more than n vertices uh, in the graph total. OK. And proving that this uh, randomness doesn't help and that, that the, the, the complexity of this problem is, uh, is also n to the 1 over k is, uh, I guess, left for uh, the paper. OK, so uh, the result that I'm not going to talk about is actually the most uh, technically involved. It does not involve lying about the size of the graph. It, uh, it uses sort of a, a, a combination of a pumping lemma tailored to trees and uh, a simulation argument. So rather than convince all the vertices that they live in a very small graph, we actually tell the vertices that they live in a really enormous graph and have them simulate the behavior of algorithms on that enormous graph. Um, and it's a completely different uh, uh, argument than most of the other gap theorems on, on this slide. OK, so that only applies to trees. And, uh, and it's a, sort of a, an interesting open question whether you can get a similar gap on, on general graphs. OK, so here are some interesting open questions. Uh, I think the foremost one is to really uh, figure out the, the complexity of the Lavash local lemma under a polynomial criterion of your choice. And uh, one of the funny things about this question is that you know, we don't know what the answer is, but we do know that you have to simultaneously get the randomized and deterministic complexity settled in the same paper. You can't solve these problems independently. They're basically one and the same. So. Uh, the randomized, uh, I mean, you, you could solve the deterministic complexity in one paper and then the randomized one next, but you can't do it in the, in the opposite order. The randomized complexity depends on the deterministic one. Okay. So uh, another open problem that I am interested in is um, basically I want to know how far this, this hypergraph Ramsey argument can go and whether you can actually show that nothing exists in the range between constant time and less than log star time. Uh, or whether we need some new arguments to actually understand this this uh, this territory of the complexity uh, spectrum. And uh, lastly, I mean, everything I talked about, um, I mean, it applies to graphs 
in one way or the other with unbounded degree. I mean, some of the results hold as is, some results hold when you parameterize by delta, and some of them kind of go out the window as soon as delta is not constant. Um, so to really understand the complexity hierarchy for unbounded degree graphs is a, is a, is a challenging problem. And um, it's all, I mean, it's already unclear what the answer, you know, in terms of what the answer should look like in terms of its format. Uh, for example, uh, delta plus one coloring, you know, has algorithms that have running times that are largely expressed in terms of delta, and then it has running times that are expressed uh, in terms of n that are independent of delta, uh, even, you know, even when delta, uh, delta is unbounded. Um, so it's, it's unclear what part you want. Maybe you want um, a hierarchy that's just in terms of delta running times or a hierarchy that's independent of delta. I mean, you have to rephrase the, the question a little, maybe. Okay. <clears throat> All right, that's all I have. Thank you, Seth. Uh, now I'm going to ask, are there any questions from any of the audience? Yeah, I guess I have a question, though it's not uh, maybe horribly relevant because you talked mostly about this bounded degree model. So for example, if we allow large degrees, are there known gaps between uh, like the model when we talk to like one neighbor per round versus like all possible neighbors? at the same time? Um, I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, most of the literature I'm familiar with considers models where you get to talk to all your neighbors, but maybe the constraints are, are, are on the size of the messages. Um, I don't know many good uh, results on models where you can only talk to one at a time, um, and I guess. In some sense, I mean, you might have to assume that you're in some sort of asynchronous model, and then the notion of time is a little flexible, right? Thanks. Uh, is it supposed to be obvious that uh, randomness does not help for the two and a half coloring problem? Uh, no, it, it's not really obvious, but um, it should feel natural because um, the thing that you're asking these algorithms to do is two color a path. And the only way to two-color a path is to know your distance from one endpoint of the path or another, because you have to correlate your, your answer with the, an endpoint of the path. So, I mean, it makes sense that randomness can't help just because, you know, you can't guess what the, how long your path is unless you've seen the length. Okay, okay thank you. I have a question. Um, I was wondering, uh, you, you talked about LCLs. Are there any other, perhaps, natural problems that you consider could consider in the local model? Uh, that fall outside of LCLs? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's several problems that make sense. Um, for example, I mean, if you just wanted to um, uh, compute your distances from a, a specific source in the graph, um, I mean, the complexity of that problem is pretty obvious, but the resulting labeling would be uh, a distance, and a distance does does not come from an alphabet size that's independent of n. It, you know, it comes from an alphabet size that depends on n. So that doesn't quite fit in the framework of an LCL. Um, other problems are approximation algorithms, where um, let's say you you want to guarantee a global um, approximation of some quantity. Uh, but that the, a global approximation of some quantity is not necessarily witnessed by locally uh, lo local neighborhoods that look a certain way. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Do you think there's any hope for a time hierarchy theorems for these types of problems? Um, no idea. Haven't thought about. It. Any yeah, more questions? I have another another question, which I, I think is a little bit more philosophical. So basically, uh, in all these models and in all these papers, you are solving some graph problem, but on a graph which exactly corresponds to your network topology. I always uh, was thinking that it sounds like a little bit of a, of an arbitrary restriction. Has people looked at the cases when like the graph we care about and the network graph are actually different? Maybe they're close, but they're nevertheless different. Um, I don't. I don't know any work that looks at the case where there are two completely independent graphs. Uh, but the congested clique model does look at, at, a, at a nice situation where the communications network is a complete graph mm -hmm. and the input graph is arbitrary and the, the data about which edges are present or missing is stored at all the nodes. Mm -hmm. So you can talk to anybody you want at any round. You don't have to be connected to them by an edge, but um, 
But there, the, the communications graph is fixed. I mean, it's it's not an arbitrary graph. Mm -hmm. So potentially, you can imagine that there is some notion of like distance between graphs, such that the smaller this distance is, the, the easier it becomes to solve. But yeah, well, it's, mm -hmm. it's, yeah. yeah. If there is, a, are there any further questions? If not, we're going to take this offline. Uh, you can still hang around and talk to Seth a bit more if he has time to stick around. Um, besides that, I want to remind you that two weeks from now we have Ola Svensson, and then one week after that we have Vinod. Thanks all for coming. Thank you. Thank you.